Again, good evening, everyone. It's once again that we've come together uh, to complete and to study this book, Colossians. And tonight we're going to be completing the book of Colossians. We're going to be looking at chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. As we continue to talk about the sufficiency of Christ, our topic tonight is going to be a friendly farewell. So as we close our study in Colossians, uh, one of the things I want you to remember is that the overall theme of this letter to the Colossians is the preeminence and the sufficiency of Christ in all things. And, and I think Paul has made that perfectly clear to us as we've gone through and as we've looked at all that's going on, when we talk about the preeminence of Christ, we're talking about uh, the fact that Christ is first place in everything, that 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 he is above every and all things. He, he's first in importance. He's first in honor. He's first in exhortation. And when we deal with this word preeminence, the magnitude of that word puts us in a place where what we deal with is the fact that Christ is the head and the tail, that he is the beginning and the end, that he is the alpha and the omega. And because of that, what, what Paul wants us to understand as we go through this little uh, book is that he is sufficient in all things. That means he's all that we need. But we don't need Christ plus. We need Christ and him alone to take care of and to make sure that we, he can get us from here to eternity and, and everything in between. And so I love how uh, this has come together to help us really deal with the preeminence of Christ. And, and how that makes him sufficient in every situation for everything that happens in life. And so Paul wrote this letter, and you all know, to rebut the false teachers and to defend the sufficiency of Christ. And we just talked about how that works. Uh, in the first section of the letter, he underscores the sufficiency of Christ as our Lord. He, he, he is our savior. He is our Lord. He is our leader. Um, in the second portion of that, Paul underscores and talks about the sufficiency of Christ as our life. He's everything we need for life and for godliness. And the scripture continues to remind us of that as we go from one chapter of the of the Bible to the next, from one book to the next, from one verse to the next. Uh, we see uh, strong through the pages and the annals of, of our scripture that Christ is our life. And so in this remaining section of Colossians in chapter four, Paul continues to emphasize the sufficiency of Christ as our leader. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So here in verses 7 through 18 of chapter 4, what we're going to get to see tonight is we're going to see a group photo of all those people who supported or those who were with Paul in ministry while he was imprisoned in Rome. And, and, and you ask yourself, and, and I did when I started reading this, you might think uh, these verses are just Paul's personal data thrown in at the end, and they don't really have anything to do with us. And, and since we have the faintest idea who most of them are, uh, uh, we're not sure if it even matters that we know who they are. But what Swindoll says in, in the commentary is that it does matter. And, and as you go through, you'll see why it does matter. Uh, in this final section of friendly farewell, Paul expresses his deepest gratitude for the faithful friends who stuck by him and made it possible for him to accomplish his ministry calling because of their faithfulness. And that's what we want to take away from this particular lesson is that God places people strategically in our lives. He, he plants them with us where he's put us to serve so that what they might be able to do is to help us to move through all that is going on in ministry and help us to accomplish the goals that God himself has already set for us. So let's take a look. So in these last 12 verses, the Apostle Paul is going to name 10 friends who've been a vital part of his life and his ministry. And if, if we reflect back on our own lives, even if we have not done a lot in ministry, 
all of us have come through some things in life. And as we reflect back on those things, we, we can see some folks and, and we can hear some folks that have that have planted seeds and, and, and validated our lives and helped us to move forward. And that's what Paul wants us to understand as we go into these particular scriptures is that sometimes you just got to step back a minute and recognize that what, how good God has been, not in that he has given you what you need in terms of uh, providing for your substance and providing for your livelihood, but he's placed people in your life that's made a difference without whom your life would not have been the same. And so I love the fact that, that the scripture is the place that we also see that happening that helps us to understand that it's not just a fluke that God has placed certain people in your life for seasons of time. So friends who stayed with him through thick and thin, who prayed with him and supported him. And, and Paul is, and this is the thing that we really have to wrestle with and deal with. Paul is even going to talk about a person who, who did not stick with him, who strayed away from not just him, but from the ministry. So let's take a look. So let's examine Paul's friendly farewell to the Colossian Christians as we get to know his circle of friends, as we learn the great need for faithful friends in ministry, and as we glean wisdom and insight for our own lives under the leadership of Christ and the words that we're hearing here from Paul. Amen. And so once again, as I've done throughout this particular lesson, is I bring to you Paul's presentation of this particular book. We, we want to talk about it because what it helps us to understand is the preeminence of Christ in everything, that Christ is supreme, that Christ is sufficient, that, 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 that he's superior, that, that submitting to him has something to do with how we move through life. And so as we continue to think about and to look at who Paul is and what Paul has done and what Paul is saying to us about God, it helps us to understand that Christ is our life, that Christ is our Lord, that Christ is our life and our love. And so we can move forward and understand a little bit more about him when we keep in mind the preeminence of Christ in all things, the supreme Lord and the sufficient Savior. And so as we delve into this friendly farewell from verses 7 through 18 of chapter 4 in Colossians, um, open up your hearts and minds as Paul speaks to us again uh, through the annals of the word of God. Amen. A friendly farewell. So Swindoll opens this lesson by reminding us of the immeasurable blessings of true friends. And, and some of you out there can testify to that and witness to, witness to that. Does anybody have any comments? The, the immeasurable blessings of true friends. Who, who has something they might want to want to interject about a friend or someone that God has placed in your life that has that has been instrumental in where you are and where you're going and, and what God has done and doing in your life. Anybody have something they want to share? And I like how he does this. Uh, someone now opens quoting Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And here's what he says. He says, friendship is a sheltering tree. Think about that for a minute. What does that mean? In, in, in the in the course of life, what does that mean? And to that he says, uh, "How right he is! Think about how right he is that friendship is a sheltering tree." Anybody have anything you want to say? Here's why he says that. He says, "Friends reach out to us and offer us refuge." like the branches of a tree. They give us shade, shelter, provisions, and protection. Friends, we're talking true friends. They invite us to a familiar place of refreshment, retreat, and repose. A true friend will do those kinds of things for us. True friends provide three things vital for a quality life. Here's what friends provide. First, friends provide us with companionship, without which we'd be lonely and isolated. And many of us can attest to how that feels from our long stint with COVID when we 
were socially distancing and when we were uh, quarantined in our homes. We can, we can attest to the fact that companionship is a necessary part of life. Nobody has been called to walk this thing alone. Not only do they provide us with companionship, friends provide for us comfort. You know, we can get a pat on the back, a, a shoulder to cry on, a kind word of consolation when we need somebody to validate us, when we need somebody to let us know that God is yet on the throne, when we need somebody. Though that's what friendship is. That's what friends do for one another. And then it says friends provide accountability and perspective. And I had to step back a little bit from this. Uh, which we need to keep us on the straight and narrow. And, and when I looked at this, the thing is, many of us, most of us, and a lot of us don't want to be accountable for what we've done and what we say. And, and, and so when we talk about accountability, what we're saying is that it means that we're taking personal responsibility for our actions and for our words. Friends help us to do that. They help us to, if they're true friends, they're going to tell us the truth, number one. If they're true friends, they're going to help us to look past our own understanding at what might be. They're going to help us to understand those things. They give us perspective. Perspective is the ability or the capacity to view, to view things in their true re relations and their relative importance to what is going on in life. Friends help us with that. They help us to, to look past our stuff and to consider another alternative, another perspective. And, and so when we look at this whole thing about friends helping us to be accountable, they help us to take personal responsibility for what we've done and what we've said and how we've, how we've participated in things. Friends don't sugarcoat stuff. If you've got somebody that's a yes man and telling you everything you want to hear and, 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 and yes and amen to everything you do, you might not have a friend. But a friend will tell you when you're wrong. But a friend will encourage you when you're right. And so those are the things that we want to really keep in mind as we look at this friendly farewell and these 10 uh, people that Paul is going to introduce us to in this lesson tonight. Here's what else he says that I really like. It's by sharing our lives with others outside our families. Our world is enlarged. I love that. Because what that says is, if I have a friend that I can take, that I can empathize with, if I can get into that friend's life in such a way that whatever's going on in that life can impact my life, then my world can be enlarged because of that. Our hearts are strengthened and our minds are sharpened with new and fresh insight. Those are some of the things that friends will provide for us. And so as you think about Paul helping, talking about these friends who stuck with him through thick and thin, they've been shoulders for him to cry on. They've been people that kept him accountable to what God had called him to do. They've been people who helped him see the bigger picture, not just what he wanted, but what God was doing in the midst of what was going on. These were the friends. They were companions. They went with him. From, from one place to the next place. There were some of them who were in Rome with him doing these home arrests. There were some who went on all of these, the, these three missionary journeys. There were some who comforted him when he needed comforting. Those are our friends that God places in our life strategically as we do this work called ministry. And so listen, as a, as a psychologist notes, the importance of friendship in our overall health. Here's what he says. He says, I've discovered that friendship is the springboard to every other love. Think about it. What's he mean? He says, friendship spills over into the other important relationships in our lives. People with no friends usually have a diminished capacity for sustaining any kind of love. The most miserable people I've ever met are people who are just grumpy and have no friends. I don't need nobody. We all need somebody. And that's what this lesson wants us. It's going to help us understand. They tend to go through a succession of marriage. These are people with no friends. 
be estranged from, estranged from various family members and have trouble getting along with their coworkers. These are people who, who, who don't see the value in letting themselves um, uh, risking being vulnerable before someone enough to be a friend, enough to have a friend. On the other hand, those who learn how to love their friends tend to have long and fulfilling marriages, work well on business teams, and they enjoy the life that they have built and that God has established with them and their children. Amen? Questions or comments? Anybody uh, thinking about this? This friendship is the springboard of every other kind of love. How does how that hit you? <clears throat> Well the, well, the word says, you know, if one is going to be first, must first show themselves friendly. If you want a friend, you must first show yourself to be friendly Amen. so that uh, others will respond to the light that you are shining. Yeah. Anybody else? Friendship is the springboard to every other kind of love. No, notice he didn't say every other kind of relationship. He said love. Anybody, I'll come back to that. And so if we look to Christ our leader as our example, we see that he too had friends who labored with him. Some very close, others more on the periphery of his ministry. He had more than 500 brethren to whom he appeared after his resurrection. First Corinthians tell us that. He had 70 whom he sent out in pairs to preach. Luke kind of gives us a little bit more information about that. He had the 12 disciples who were with him day in and day out. And within that group, there was Peter, James, and John with whom he had a special personal bond. And even among those three, he seemed to have an especially intimate friendship with John. And to the point that he called him the disciple whom he loved. And, and so if Jesus has friends, if, if, he, if, if, the, if the value, if friendship is so valuable that Jesus brought into his circle those whom he called friend and even someone he called uh, uh, his beloved disciple, then how much more do we need friends? All of these and many others were involved in Jesus' life and in his ministry. They provided companionship not only for Jesus himself, but also for one another. They were, they were there to help each other out. And so this concentric circle of friends were like sheltering trees granting comfort and accountability. This circle of friends. Paul uses this circle of friends to encourage the Colossians and all the churches that will read this letter by telling us a little bit about each one of these friends. So who were these friends? Let's take a look at it. We start in, in chapter four, verse seven, and Paul starts to tell us, naming these friends and giving us just a little bit of information about them. And here's what he said. He says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. Now, remember, he's writing this letter to the church in Colossae. He says, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may, that he may know your circumstance. So we're going to learn some about you and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? They will, Tychicus and Onesimus, they will make known to you all the things which are happening here. And he's in Rome. Okay. So let's see what he has to say. Here Paul mentions two of his close friends, one of whom carried this letter to the Colossian church and also a letter to the church at Ephesus and the letter to Philemon. So, so you see the, the, how, how closely knit these Pauline epistles, these prison epistles are, because these three epistles that he's talking about now, these three letters are all letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison, house arrest 
in Rome, okay? So let's take a look. Tychicus, and, and, and he's described as a man with a servant's heart, whom Paul regarded as a much loved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant. He betrays him as consistent and loyal and trustworthy and reliable. But well, Paul says there, look, look at what he says in verses seven and eight. He says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, I just said that a faithful minister, a, a, a fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. He says, I'm sending them to you for this very purpose. And I love the fact that he says, I'm sending him. And what I want him to do is I want him to let you know what's going on with me, that he may know your circumstance and comfort your heart. So I'm sending him so that he can bring to you a word of my condition that it might comfort you, that you, your hearts might be comforted and that he might be able to speak into your circumstances based on what he's learned here. And so let's see what he says. Someone intimately familiar, Tychicus was someone intimately familiar with Paul's condition, who could reflect the character of Paul, the life of Paul and the ministry of Paul. Uh, as, as his brother, remember he said, much beloved brother. And then he said he's a faithful minister, but starting to talk about all of the character traits of, of Tychicus. And as he does that, sending him to the church at, at Colossae, and what he wants him to be able to do is to reflect who Paul is. Remember, Paul is on the house arrest. He can't go. He can't go. But, 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 but if he has a friend, who, who is intimate enough with him to be able to reflect on who he is, his character, his life, his ministry, then he has what he needs to continue to do the work of ministry that God called him to do. Hello, somebody. Uh, when, when, when we're willing to be vulnerable enough to bring people into our, into our space so that they can, so we can be intimate enough with them for them to be able to to glean from us these things and learn from us and walk with us so that the very character of Paul can be reflected and expressed. That's what, that's what Paul wants us to understand about these friends. They're more than just people who, who come every now and then and, and have a lunch or have a dinner. These are people who stood with him and stuck by him. And so Tychicus has served as one of Paul's trusted uh, personal envoys back in Titus. We're seeing Titus and in Timothy where he was with him throughout. And he was from Asia Minor himself. And because of that, he knew the culture well enough and he could be trusted in all things to represent Paul well. Not only did he know the culture and how to handle the folks when he got to Colossae, he also knew Paul well enough to know how to bring what Paul had to bring to them, to them in a way that they would be able to receive it. That's what, that's what preaching and teaching the gospel, that's what being a faithful minister, that's what being a servant is all about, being able to make a presentation to someone so that, so that they are disarmed to the point that they can receive what God is saying to them through the servant he sent to them. Questions, comments? And so that's Tychicus, Onesimus is a man with a sinful past. Uh, Y'all know the story. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Who Paul described as a faithful and beloved brother. Now you see what I look at verse nine. Verse nine says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? He, he was a runaway slave from Colossae who had come to know Christ when he encountered Paul in Rome. So, so, he, so, so right away, you know something's going on. He's a runaway slave, which means that he wasn't free to leave wherever he was because he ran away. And when Onesimus escaped from serving Philemon, who was his master, he traveled west all the way to Italy, ending up by the providence of God in the rented house of Paul in Rome. Now, now how likely is it that someone runs away from, from their master, and they end up in a place where the person that they're engaged with is on the house arrest. Paul couldn't go get him. How did he get there? The providence of God. It, it was orchestrated. This is what we have to remember about God. God knows what we need and how to get it to us. 
whether we understand it or not. Even whether we agree or not, God knows how to get us from where we are to where we need to be, that we'll be in the place he needs us to be in to receive from him what he's already planned for us, what he's already purposed for us. God knows how to get us there. Questions or comments? And so this encounter led to his conversion to Christ, which resulted in his desire to make things right with his own family. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? When, when, when Onesimus received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, his desire after that was to make things right with his own. He knew he was wrong. Whatever he did, he knew it wasn't what he was supposed to do. And the spirit of God now residing in him is telling him, okay, trust me with what is going on and go back and fix what you messed up. Now, I'm, I, hopefully I'm not the only one that's been down that road. I, I know how he feels uh, uh, now with the Lord telling him, you got to go fix that. Go, go fix that. And here's the good news. He promised he'd be with us. He promised that he would be with us. Our scripture tells us that God said, I'll go with you even to the ends of the earth. So when you go back to fix what you broke, when you go back to fix what you messed up, you don't go by yourself. You don't have to do it in your own ability. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. And so Onesimus now ha has a different orientation to life and to who he is. Even as a slave, he has a different orientation because now he belongs to Christ. And something on the inside, come on somebody, is working its way on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Now, I can't be the only one to feel that. Oh, what a change. Christ makes the difference in our lives. No matter what our circumstance, no matter what our socioeconomic levels are, no matter what our educational levels are, no matter what community we live in, Christ makes the difference. That's what you need to take with you. If you haven't seen any change, you need to go back on your knees. If nothing is changing for you, go back to the Lord. You might need a redo. I love how he brought this forward. Now he has a, not only he has a desire. <laughs> it's not that he feels obligated to do it. Come on, somebody. His, his, he wants to do it. You hear that? Question, comment. It's interesting how Paul describes these two close friends. Onesimus, who was legally a slave, was simply called a brother in Christ. You see that? While Tychicus, who was free, was called a bond servant, literally a slave in Christ. Wrestle with that a little bit. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Now I don't have to do all the talking. Anybody? Other than the fact that Paul is um, taking one who is free and declaring that that person is committed to Christ as a bond servant, and then say just the reverse, saying that the slave by birth or by circumstance, uh, in this case, uh, Onesimus, is really the one that is free uh, as my brother. Okay? Amen. But Paul sees all men in Christ as brothers and sisters, or all men and women, as brothers and sisters in Christ going forward, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Anybody else? I thought I heard somebody trying to come in. 
Okay. And so perhaps Paul was intentionally trying to put things in perspective. The unity believers have in Christ as brothers and sisters does not cancel out our social distinction. I thought that was interesting. Because many times we come to Christ and what we're looking for is a way out. <laughs> we're looking to escape some circumstances or, or, or some plight or, 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 or some social uh, 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 economic situation. Many times we come looking for an escape. But what we, we hear here is, is that, that, that being brothers and sisters in Christ doesn't necessarily change those social distinctions. What does it do? However, I, uh, and I love this, we, we must regard those distinctions as secondary to our primary identity as members of the family of God. Regardless of our ethnicity and our social status, or our gender. Remember what he says here in Galatians, neither Greek nor, nor slave, neither, neither Greek nor Jew, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, all of us are one in Christ. And that's where the distinction comes in, one in Christ. And so we have to remember that even as Onesimus is trying to, 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 to validate where he is and, and trying to make sense of what's going on in his life, and, and now has a desire in the midst of all of that, you know, you can imagine him saying, okay, what's going to happen to me? But because of Christ and because of the spirit at work in his life, he still wants to make things right, regardless to the outcomes or the circumstances surrounding all of that or what happens to him as he goes back. And so we want to remember those things as, as we continue to go forward. So in Colossians chapter nine, we're told that both these men, the veteran minister Tychicus and the new convert Onesimus would represent Paul to the church in Colossae. They would give an oral report, we read that, about what was happening to him in Rome, both of them. It, 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 he didn't say one, he said both, okay? And so Paul depends, depended on Tychicus, a man with a servant's heart, and Onesimus, a man with a sinful past, as his hands and his feet and his mouth while he was under house arrest in Rome. He depended on them to carry the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the church that he sent them to, to minister to, and to encourage and to lift up. What's God sending us to do? And he is dependent on you and me to do just that, to be his hands and, and his feet and his mouth, no matter what the circumstances socially we find ourselves in, but we are expected to be his ministers, to be his mouthpiece and to do the work that he's given us to do. And, and here's the other thing, these two enable Paul to continue to do the work of ministry even when he could not leave his home in Rome. God always makes a way. That's why we need a concentric circle that will stick with us in ministry, that will encourage us to keep on allowing the Lord to lead us and guide us even when we can't leave our homes Keep on trusting God with what you can't validate and what you can't see and what you don't understand. Keep on trusting God. And I know because our hearts are so heavy over these last few weeks that trusting God is where we need to be. We need to be there. And so as we move forward, Paul moves on. He, he, he's talked about these two. Now he's going to introduce us to several others who are there. Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Hold on to that. Mark, Mark and 
Aristarchus, and Justice. He said, these are the only fellow workers of the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. In other words, these are the only Jewish Christian converts that are part of uh, the work of ministry that I'm doing here. That's what he's saying. Okay. And so next, Paul mentions six more friends who were remaining with him in Rome. Aristarchus, Mark, Jesus, or Justice, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. These are the six. Of these six, three of them, he says, are Jewish. Let's see what he has to say about them. So the first three are Jewish. The second three are Gentiles. Paul had mentioned one of them, Epaphras, earlier in the letter. Two of them, Mark and Luke, we know well uh, uh, to us as gospel writers. And three of them are probably new to most of us. Aristarchus, Justice, and Damas are probably new to most of us. And, and if, you know, we, as we go forward, we'll learn a little bit more about them. Aristarchus is a man with a sympathetic heart who was originally from Thessalonica and was one of Paul's traveling companions during his ministry in Greece, Macedonia, and Asia Minor. And you'll see that in Mark, in, over in the book of Acts as we continue to go forward, okay? So in Colossians 4.10, let's look at 4.10. What does 4.10 say? Paul calls Aristarchus his fellow prisoner. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you receive instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. And so he calls him my fellow prisoner. And then you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? And while we are not told if he was under house arrest with Paul in Rome or was a fellow prisoner elsewhere, Aristarchus had shared some harrowing ministry experiences with Paul. In Acts chapter 19, verse 29, we learned that Aristarchus and Gainus were dragged along by a Russian mob during a riot in Ephesus while they were with Paul on one of his missionary journeys. He was with Paul during that long and treacherous voyage by ship to Italy to appeal Paul's case to Caesar, Aristarchus. He was on the, and on that journey, he, he survived to shipwreck in the Adriatic Sea and ended up on the Isle of, on the island of Malta. And you'll see that in, in so he had endured some stuff and been with Paul through some challenging and trying times in ministry. Many of us will never see those kind of things. Many of us don't go through those kinds of things in ministry as, as we continue to serve the Lord. And so the fact that Aristarchus, Aristarchus was still with Paul in Rome when he wrote this letter to the Colossians demonstrates the tenacious loyalty he had toward Paul. After going through all of that, I'm still here. I've been through all of this, but I'm still here. I'm still working it out. I'm still trying to do what God has called me to do. I'm still on your side. I'm still here for you. And when you're in the Lord's work, you need someone who is around to feel your burdens with you. Every ministry needs an Aristarchus, the sympathetic heart that helps us bear the burdens of ministry, every ministry. Have you found someone like that in your ministry? Is there somebody that, that holds you up and continues to pray for you, calls you to encourage you? We got several of those in, in our church. They just called to, to say, I'm just praying for you. We did, That was Deacon Street. I'm praying for you, Lord. I'm praying for you. And so Paul is helping us to understand that there is a need for these kinds of people in ministry. And so the trials and the hardships they experienced together served to strengthen their bond and their loyalty toward their mutual leader, Jesus Christ. So they saw Jesus as their leader and their bond, the bond and the things that they've experienced together. And that's what happens to us. We learn how to trust God more and more as we, as we, as we are able to lean on one another and, and stretch out a little bit and be loyal to what God has called us to do in ministry. As we do those things, not only do we learn to love one another and to be unified in what God has called us to do, but, but we also learn how to be loyal and, and how to bond together, not just with ourselves, but with God. And so that's part of, of what this 
th these verses are helping us to understand that, that names are more than just names. Names are people who impact our lives in significant ways that enable us and empower us to do what God has called us to do. Mark is another friend. Mark was a man with a promising future. <laughs> I love that about Mark. And, and we'll see why. Uh, Paul refers to John Marcus as, 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 as Barnabas's cousin. I thought that was interesting. Interesting. It's likely that the Colossians had heard of Barnabas, but may not have been familiar with Mark, who had earlier, look at, look at John Mark, who had earlier abandoned Paul and Barnabas midway through Paul's first missionary journey. We'll find all of that information recorded for us in the book of Acts. So, so, so Barnabas, Mark was Barnabas's cousin, but um, Paul says he has a promise in future. Why is that? Why did he talk about his future? Because right now he's dealing with what Mark had done previously, what he had done previously. And Mark's departure later caused a break in the relationship between Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, now that's, that's interesting for us to keep, uh, to make note of going forward that even though there are individuals who may make mistakes or or cause a, a division in the church momentarily. Certainly in the case of Paul and Barnabas, the, he actually severed their relationship when the second missionary journey came about. If you read over the book of Acts, uh, Paul was so adamant that uh, not to allow John Mark to go back again. He said, no, this boy is, has not matured to the point that he's able to go on these missionary journeys. So, so we, why would you want to take him on the second one when he did not complete the first missionary journey? But Barnabas wanted to. And so he and Barnabas went in one direction. And the Bible says that, that Paul took Silas with him on that second journey. And that's what is being recorded for us in the book of Acts is Paul's uh, journey with Silas as opposed to Barnabas' journey with, with John Mark. But it's interesting to note that now at the end of uh, Paul's uh, journey and letters, et cetera, et cetera, John Mark has been uh, restored, as it were. So, so don't ever permanently discount anyone uh, out of ministry. God can can use all of us. Remember, he God made a jackass to speak, so he can use you, uh, us rather, going forward. Yes. Amen. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we get a little bit more into the lesson. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment? Anything you want to bring, bring out? And so now, some years later, Mark has been reconciled, that's what I was getting trying to with Paul and is serving alongside him in Rome. Remember, this letter to the Colossians, in this final farewell section, Paul is telling the Colossian church that these are the people that are greeting you, who, who are here with me, who are standing with me, who are doing this work of ministry with me. So, so Mark is one of those people. In fact, toward the end of Paul's life, Paul would request Mark's presence saying in verse 11 of, of uh, 4 Timothy 2, he is, for he is useful to me for ministry. Not only has Paul, um, at some years have passed and, and John Mark has continued. Remember Barnabas took him with him. And, and I can imagine that that, that the encourager, Barnabas, uh, kept him moving in the right direction toward righteousness. And as, Paul, as he matured, he continued to understand things and continue to learn things to the point now, as Paul is coming to the close, come on, coming to the close of his life, he recognizes the, the faithfulness now of, of, of Mark and who Mark is because of how he has been ministered to and, de and, and developed under the leadership of Barnabas. 
I love it. He said, for he is useful to me in ministry. And though the friendship between young John Mark and Paul had been strained earlier on, both of them grew through the struggle. And that's what that's who God is. When, when we struggle in life and in ministry and in our relationships with one another, life is not a crystal stairway. We're not going to get to heaven on a flowery bed of ease. We're not even going to be able to relate to one another that way. We're going to have to do some compromising and we're going to have to do some, uh, some reflecting and we're going to have to do some, some soul searching in order for us to have meaningful and, 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 and healthy relationships with one another. And so both of them had grown through their struggles, through what they'd both been through. Remember, Paul had gone, uh, uh, he, he's now under house arrest in Rome. So he's, th this is after his journeys, after all of his journeys, he, he's under house arrest now in Rome. And, and in the midst of all of that, He's saying, you know, John Mark it can be useful to me at this point. Yeah, this is this is about twelve to thirteen years later from that first missionary uh, journey, uh, missionary journey uh, to where we are now. This Colossians written in AD sixty two, uh, so from about forty nine with the first journey to AD sixty two is um, you do the math right. That's twelve, thirteen years, right? Yeah. yeah. And Paul will live for another uh, six years. Um, um, uh, he's under house arrest. He's going to be released for about uh, 18 months to three years uh, and then rearrested and sometime around AD 68. So six years from the writing of this book, uh, Paul is going to be uh, um, beheaded from what I understand. Yeah. So just kind of give you a time reference on that. And so, as you can see, it says that Mark grew in maturity. He had to mature a little bit and in fortitude. But Paul grew in patience and forgiveness. You know, the, the, look, look at the different ways that they, Mark matured and, and got a, a kind of a backbone, a stick to itiveness. I can do this thing, you know. I, I don't have to run every time things don't look right, okay? Uh, fortitude. He, he needed a little, a little stay with it that he didn't have before, trusting God and, and being able to allow God to, to take him to the next thing, even though I don't understand where I'm going, I don't know what it looks like, and I don't know how to get there on my own, but I trust you, God. Mark Lee needed a little bit more of that. And, and, and so he grew, as he matured, he grew that way. But look what it says about Paul. Paul, Paul had to be able to have some patience. And we're talking to some of our ministry leaders now. We need to be patient and forgiving in how we develop our young ministers and those people who are coming behind us, those who we are handing the ministry off to. They're not as mature as we are. They, they haven't seen as much stuff as we have. There hasn't been enough water under that bridge to stand them up. And, and they know that I can do this thing. And, and so Paul had to grow to the point that he could be patient with God, not, not just with John Mark. Listen to what I'm saying. Paul had to grow to be patient with God. God, I trust you. And, and, and he had to grow to the point that he could forgive John Mark for, for what he himself, Paul, decided wasn't appropriate. <laughs> did, 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 did God make that? Did God do that? Or was it that Paul, was the one who was angry because God could have been the one who just moved John Mark because he knew he wasn't ready. He couldn't have handled it. He would have been more troubled than he would have been good. And that's the same thing that happens in some of our ministries. Some folks aren't ready. Some folks need a little more time. Some folks just need to be encouraged. Some people need for us to go to them and just ask them. And so as we go through this, we can see how these things do matter in ministry. And it's good for us to be able to glean them from the scripture and what God is teaching us in his word. How does this thing work? Well, we have to learn how to put it to action. And so Mark grew, he matured, and he grew in fortitude. 
But Paul had to grow in his patience and his forgiveness. And when you mesh all that together, what you're able to get is the reconciliation. What you're able to get is a Paul at the end of his life that can say, he'll be useful to me in ministry. Because he can do all things through Christ who strengthened him. And so we have to be able to do that even in our own ministries. And then he talks a little bit about Jesus. Who, who, who is called justice. He's a man with a strong commitment. He was the third of the Jewish believers mentioned by Paul, and he happens to share the same Hebrew name as our Lord Jesus Christ, Joshua. Joshua. He also shared his Latin name, Justice, with two other men in the book of Acts. And if you look in Acts, you will see in chapter one and chapter 18, there are two other men called justice, okay? And here's what it says. We know little about this justice except that he, Aristarchus, and Mark were the only Jewish people that Paul called fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Look, 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 in, verse, look in verse 11. Paul says, they have been they have proved to be a comfort to me. They have proved to be a comfort to me. And, 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 and you see what he's saying? So, so these three, he's saying, they, 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 they've comforted me. They've been there for me. And, and, and in the midst of all of this, I can, I can do what God has called me to do because I have them here to help me through this thing called ministry. First oh, I know. I can, I got to. I just got to chime in right there, Jack. Well, let me go. Let me go back. No, no, no. Don't go backwards. I mean, uh, this is just for Ebenezer, and Ebenezer knows this. That's why we have uh, associate ministers. That's why we have deacons who are, who are running the family deacon ministry. Because you know, if Pastor Lundy attempted to do all that, he'd be a basket case. He'd be he'd be worn out. He'd be and after thirty three years, he'd have died in in year eighteen. Okay, and so what Paul is saying, and certainly I'm echoing the words of Paul, that uh, that my that those who are helping me, they they are they are comfort to me. Urban Street was a comfort to me. Amen. When it came to baptism, all all I had to do is say, Irvin, I say, Irvin, we're gonna baptize and give him the date. He and Marion would put them on the calendars. All I had to do is tell him the date. That which Saturday we were going to go down to the historical site, and that was it. I'd show up, like I said in my sermon, there'd be coffee on my desk many a times, or at least bottled water if it's in the middle of uh, uh, July or August, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, he was a comfort to me. I had to worry about stuff like that. Amen. Amen. Look at what Paul has to say. I want to take, take your attention back to what he said about, about, um, Tychicus and Onesimus. He says, they're going to make known to you all things which are happening here. So they're going to carry back and encourage the people in what is going on in Paul's life. And then look what he says about um, Aristarchus, uh, Mark, and Justice. They have proved to be a comfort to me. And as you see what he's doing, he, he, he's helping us now to understand just the impact, like Pastor was just saying, that these people had on his life. Remember what I said, that, 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 uh, that, that um, Aristarchus was able to, to talk about Paul, his character, his life, and his ministry. He could reflect on all those things. And, and, and now Paul is telling us that justice and um, now Tychicus was the one and Aristarchus and Mark comforted him in all that's going on. And so you see how it is important that we learn and that we, and that we cultivate and develop these kinds of friendships and relationships, not just in ministry, but in life. So verse, verse 12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you. 
also always, look at this, laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And then he says, for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He should have said two, but I'll say two for him. And so among any of the Christian groups, <clears throat> among, any, among any group of Christian friends, there are usually one or two who are known for their faithful intercession. In Paul's circle of friends, Epaphras filled that role. Remember what he said about him right there in, in verse 12. He says, Epaphras is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer. Epaphras was the prayer warden. Epaphras is a man with a single passion. Listen to this. He, he was originally a member of the Colossian church, in fact, he was one, he was the one who introduced, who initially brought the gospel to the Colossians, Epaphras. He was the one who initially preached to them, not Paul. He, he, he was an all-in servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose passion could be measured as he prayed earnestly and specifically for the Colossians and the neighboring congregations in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. And you'll see that in, chat, in verses 12 through 13. We'll get to that in a few minutes. He tells us that he prayed for all of these churches. That we need prayer warriors in our churches today. Always laboring fervently for you in prayer is what verse 13 says. Paul says laboring fervently in prayer is not simply flipping up little thoughts of God. It is agonizing. It is struggling. It is wrestling with God like Jacob did and saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Now, somebody got to know how that feels, that you agonize in prayer. Prayer is not something that, that is flippant, that you can just, just sit down and say, okay, I'm just going to say something. And you, prayer is something that we come to intentional. And we agonize in it and we struggle in it and we wrestle with God in prayer, knowing that he is listening. How important is what you are calling on the Lord for? How important is it to you? Is it important enough for you to agonize in it? Is it important enough for you to struggle with it? Is it important enough for you to do like Jacob, wrestle with the Lord until he blesses you? How important. Laboring fervently in prayer. Comments or questions? Anybody? Any of our prayer warriors out there got something? And so Paul said, I hear him. <laughs> he said, I hear him. He says, I hear him laboring for you. Verse 13, for I bear him witness. I bear him witness. I, I hear him laboring, meaning he's agonizing in prayer for you. He's always on his knees, laboring, working at it, agonizing in it, in prolonged, intense, effectual, fervent prayer. Paul says, I hear him, for I, he, for I bear witness that he has a great zeal for you and those, and not just you, but those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. I bear witness, I hear him praying for you, interceding for you, on his knees for you. Paul said, I hear him. Paul knew the spiritual condition of the Colossians because he had witnessed the passionate prayers and the deep concern of Epaphras for that church. What are your deep concerns? What are you laboring before the Lord for? Or are you laboring? What do you need to labor before the Lord for? Think about it. Comments? Questions?
every ministry needs an apostle. You hear what I'm saying? A faithful minister with a single passion. Come on, y'all. Every ministry. A prayer warrior who's always laboring fervently in prayer for the ministry. For the minister. For, 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 for the kingdom. Mr. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Sister Jackie. Yes, ma'am. Just to say, this is um, Reverend Summary, that prayer is one of those things, like we would say, Deacon Streets, that you definitely have to do it on purpose. Amen. You have to find the time to do it, because if you don't, you won't. Make the and time. We'll feel, we feel, you got to make the time to do it. And um, sometimes it demands a sacrifice, which should be all good. You know, if we make a sacrifice um, for God. But yes, we have to find the time to do it. We can never put it on the back burner. We can never get to the point where we say we'll we'll do it eventually. Amen. But it's always appropriate. That's all I can say. It's always appropriate. Always needed. Thank you. Always. 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 And I love what Paul said. He says, I I'm not just telling you uh, what I believe. I, I bear witness. <laughs> that he is fervent in prayer. I hear him praying. I know his heart for you. And, and that's where we have to be. Like I said, every ministry, ministry needs an epaphras with a single purpose. My, my purpose is to reach the Lord in prayer. A prayer warrior, always laboring. Always. Anybody else? And so that was Epaphras, the prayer warrior in the circle. Now he's going to tell us a little bit about Luke. Luke is a man with a specialized talent. I think I like that. What does that mean? And like Ar 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 Aristarchus, I was going to call him somebody else. Aristarchus. Aristarchus. Aristarchus, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is at the end. Aristarchus. Um, and like Aristarchus, he had been with Paul through many ups and downs in ministry over a long period of time. Paul had, Luke had been around for a while. Luke was not just a friend with a special talent, but, but, but he served as Paul's personal physician. In, in my studies, what, what I read was during Paul's first missionary journey, um, he, 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 he was sick. He, he, had, he was sick most of the time and, and he didn't have anybody with him. But when he went, as he went back out on the second missionary journey, he took Luke with him. And then Luke was with him through the other two, through those, those next two journeys. He was with him. And even now, as Paul is, as he is up, uh, as he is in house, on house arrest in Rome, Luke is still there with him, helping him to cope with the lingering, helping him to cope with the lingering conditions he referred to as a thorn in the flesh. Physician Luke. Having been trained as a physician, Luke is a great illustration of a man who had a specialty to offer to God. Come on, somebody. What do you have to offer to God? Here's the thing, many of us have things to offer to God that we have not even recognized he, he can and will use. Think about it. Not only could he attend to the spiritual and the practical needs of those to whom he ministered, he could also address their medical needs. That's what I call specialty that he offered. And while we don't know the extent of the role Luke played in Paul's ministry, we know that he was a gifted researcher and writer who was personally responsible for writing the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And while, while Luke was with Paul through so many things and on so many of his trips in ministry, we don't get a lot of information about what Luke was doing. But we know he was a physician. We know he was a writer. 
those things we know about him. Who are your friends? Who, who is that circle that is around you to help you to do the work of ministry that God has called you to do? Who is that circle? Think about it. Think about it. There is the us, they um, uh, indicators in the book of Acts that indicates whether or not Luke was with Paul at a particular time in, in a particular city. When as you read the book of Acts, if, if it says something like, uh, and we went to Troas or da 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 da, that means Luke was with Paul in the party as they went that way. Or if he says, and they set sail, and they set sail to Thessalonica and went by way of, that means Paul was not, I'm sorry, Luke was not with Paul when he was taking that part of the journey, et cetera, et cetera. It's called the us we uh indicators in the book of Acts. So Paul is uh, so so Luke writes the whole 27, 28 chapters, okay. but some of it was first-hand account because he was there. Some of it was explained to him when they got back together, okay? Right, and, 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 and you can glean that because he is the writer of that book. And he specifically talks about, I mean, and it kind of gives us an idea of when he's present and when he's not, basically, if that's what you're saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the book of Acts will detail many of, well, all of these journeys. And that's how we get to understand so much of what happened is because in many of those places, Luke was present. He's not just getting this second hand. He was, he was actually there doing Paul's journeys. And again, as, opposed, like, as opposed to John Mark, John Mark gets all of his gospel secondhand from Paul, but primarily from Peter. Right. Okay. And again, but, like I said, we don't, while, while he's writing firsthand in much of this book, the extent and the role that he plays is not always clear. Did, did, what did he do? Luke, I'm talking about because he's writing about Paul's ministry and what happened to Paul and the forming of the church, pretty much. Anything else, Pastor? Pastor? We can't hear you if you're talking. I'm just saying, no, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll chime in if I think, but I'm talking too much, go for it. Okay, I'll kick you out when it's done. Anybody else have anything they want to share? And so now we're going to talk about Demas. Demas. He is a man with a sad future. We're going to understand a little bit more about that. In Colossians, the only thing we learn about Demas is that he sends greetings with Luke to the church at Colossae. And you see that in verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. That's the whole statement. However, in the short book of Philemon, Demas is mentioned as a fellow laborer with Paul. Philemon's 1.24. Philemon's is only one chapter. And we'll see that. Then in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, Demas is, men Demon Demas is mentioned as having abandoned Paul because he fell in love with the world. Demas, here's what it says, having Paul, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. That's what he said. And, and so, and, and remember at the very beginning, I said that Paul, that uh, Paul is going to give us the names and show us these folks who have been uh, instrumental in his ministry. And he's even going to tell us about one who fell away. Well, that person is Demas. Let's finish looking at this. All of us know friends whose camaraderie cooled and whose faithfulness waned, all of us, whether it's in ministry or just in our own personal lives. We've got friends who, who we were just, 
we thought we'd never we'd never part that we'd be together forever yet it, it ended they began to drift and ultimately become absent or even leave the ministry and i know folks have done that and some of you do too and some of them have been at ebenezer and left and never did anything else in ministry and some like John Mark returned to service, but Demon had apparently lapsed in his years, in, in later years. And we're not told if he ever repented or returned because you don't see any more about him in scripture. So as we come to verses 15 through 18, Paul says, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nympheth, and the church that is in his house. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This is what he says. Say to him, Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received from the Lord, which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. And so finally, Paul sends greetings to the believers in Laodicea and to two more friends. And listen to this, a woman named Nympha and a man named Archippus. Nympha, or with the S, Nympha, is a Greek name that means bride or bridegroom. Mean it, mean it can be a male, it's a male or female. But scholars believe that a proper reading of the text in Colossians, where we just read, argues for the female form of the name. And what that says is, is that theologians and scholars believe that the person that is being spoken of in the text that we just read here um, uh, is a female and not a male. Okay, and verse 15 is a female and not a male. In the early centuries of, the, of church history, when Christianity was an illegal religion in the Roman, Roman Empire, churches met in private homes. And we know that, we remember that. And in, uh, in our lesson in Colossians 4.15, Paul mentions that the church in Laodicea meets in her home, a woman's home. Usually the owner of these homes were, the owners of these homes were wealthy church members whose houses were large enough to host a sizable group of people. The message to the church in, in Laodicea recorded in Revelations 3, 14 through 24 indicates that Laodicea was a wealthy church. And Nymphus may have been a wealthy matron who opened her doors and served the entire community of Laodicea. Women were deeply involved in both the ministries of Jesus and the ministry of Paul. And I'm not trying to make any statements about women. I'm just trying to go through uh, how this has been laid out to, 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 to deal with the fact that in, in everything, we, we need people who are we need male and female. Remember what the scripture says in Galatians. There's neither male nor female. There's neither Greek nor Jew. There's neither bond nor free. All of us are one in Christ. Yeah, I, 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 what, what is happening here is the, is the spelling of her name that in the, new, in the King James, in the New King James, it is with an S. Uh, it, it ends in an S, but in the NIV, it, it ends, ends in an A. Yeah, so that's the kind of controversy, but but there's a pronoun that that describes her. Um, well, it says the, the new NIV. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the, the NIV. NIV says her house. The new King James says his house. 
Okay, right. so there's a there's a dispute there on on how that name is is pronounced or should it be pronounced with a ends and an A or ends and an A S. But but the fact of the matter is is more likely a, a female as opposed to a male. That's the that's that's what scholars are saying. Yeah, but that's Swindoll's argument that it's a female as opposed to a male. Specifically in this scripture in Colossians. Not necessarily everywhere you might see it in the scripture, but here for sure. Okay. And so in Romans 16, 1 through 15, uh, we're talking about women in the ministry. Paul mentions 10 women whom he regarded as ministry partners. These women were not just committed servants of the church, but also faithful friends of the apostle Paul. Archippus, Archippus is in Philippians, in, in Philemon's one and two, Paul calls him our fellow soldier, implying that he was a hardworking, committed, faithful minister of the gospel. However, in Colossians, Paul exhorts him to take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. And I thought that was interesting. He says, look, take heed, deal with this thing, the ministry that you have been given by the Lord. We didn't, we didn't hand this to you. The Lord gave it to you, that you fulfill it, that you don't let it go, that you don't drop it because of something that's going on. And that's the message we, 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 we get from this is that, that when God gives us something to do, when he gives us a ministry, it is our ministry to fulfill. And what Paul is saying, do it. And while we're not told the kind of ministry he serves, uh, he may have been one of the pastoral leaders in the church at Colossae. And this exhortation was meant to encourage him in defending the faith against the threat of Gnostic heresy that was finding its way through the church in Colossae as these false teachers were trying to say that Christ was not enough for salvation. That's, that's the whole, and, and then the, the Jewish, the Jewish mysticists were trying to say, you, you, you also need circumcision. You also need uh, uh, the Sabbath. You also need these other things. It's not just Christ. And so he's saying to him, uh, he's exhorting him and trying to say, you need to defend the faith against these threats. And you need to stand firm on your defense of the faith, knowing that God is with you. And, and, and so that's possibly to what Paul is referring in verse 17 of Colossians chapter four. Okay. Regardless, Paul sought to encourage him by telling him to stay the course. Hang in there. God got you. I love that. Not pointing any fingers. And, and that's the thing that we have to not do as we are working together in ministry. We don't point fingers at one another and start to blame and start to say that this is because of you and that is because of you. What we need to do is say, stay the course, trust God, hang in there because God is gonna work it. If you believe what the scripture says that all things work together for good, even our ups and our downs, our mistakes and our failures will work together for good when we're willing to trust God with them. You got to know that. And that is how you have to do this work of ministry. If you had to get it all right, none of us would be here. Right, right. It, 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 it's almost, it can be also a, um, a as, you, as you stated, a word of encouragement coming from a senior statesman who has been in the service of the Lord uh, for, for, for quite a while who is now telling a younger person, it doesn't indicate that, but it could very well be a younger person or someone who is thinking about um, uh, what, what Demas has done, you know, leaving the ministry. And he kind of says this word, take heed, is it, kind of like, uh, watch, watch yourself, okay? Yeah. Be, be careful, uh, see to it that you do what the Lord has, told you to do what you have already begun, the work that you have begun, God who, who has begun a good work and you will see it unto completion. So uh, this is this might be Paul's as the bishop of the church and certainly as a senior uh, elder within the body of Christ is just reminding somebody else who might be 
not so much faltering, but may be on, you know, teetering or may, may be in, in a state of depression uh, or, or giving up or burnout. And he's trying to encourage him uh, to refocus, reset, and uh, re-engage, okay, going forward. Okay. Amen. To stay okay. fresh. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that they want to, to add here or to, to say here? You know, so much has been said about how we come to Christ in ministry. And I, and I love the fact that he's used uh, how these people have influenced his life to help us understand a little bit better a little bit more about how we can handle ministry in spite of the challenges, in spite of uh, uh, our, even our own abilities to do so when we're willing to trust God. And so, and so Paul is in, I believe that Paul is encouraging him just to, to hang in there, you know, uh, do what you know to be the right thing to do. Uh, and, 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 and God is going to see us through. And, and that's what's going on right now as we, as we are, dealing with this this society that we're living in where truth doesn't seem to be truth anymore and and and, and where um we we just we're just looking for something to blame i i this is the this is the blameless con uh, culture i've ever been in everybody blames somebody for something regardless you got to find somebody to blame and, and so he's trying to i believe he's trying to tell us that 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 just Stay the course. You, you don't have to blame somebody. Just trust the trust God. You don't. You don't have to do that. And so, regardless, Paul sought to to encourage him and, and to tell him just just stay the course. Hang in there, buddy. It, yes, it's tough, and it, it might get tougher, but God is on your side. God is with you. He promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He promised that he'll never put more on you than you can bear. He promised that he'd be with you even to the ends of the earth. He promised that he would supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. He promised that his that that everything is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. He promised us. And so we have to hold on to those promises. No matter how bad it looks. Because it is going to get worse before it gets better. Remember that. And so Paul ends this letter to the, to the Colossians with a touching handwritten farewell. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Verse 18. Verse 18. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. And so, and so with these brief words, he asked for their prayers of concern and intercession. Remember my imprisonment. Remember my chains. And then he prays a blessing for them. Look what he says. Grace be with you. So remember me in your prayers. Intercede. But to you I say, grace be with you. Paul's farewell demonstrates his priority of prayer, reminding us that our sufficiency comes not from ourselves, but from Jesus Christ, who is sufficient as our Lord, he is sufficient as our life, and he is sufficient as our leader, a friendly farewell. And so what is the application of this friendly farewell? I love the way he closes this because it, it helps me to see a little bit past where I was. So Swindoll closes by saying, there, there are no nobodies. Listen to what he says. There are no nobodies. Many of us can name some major figures that have impacted our lives in big ways. And I hope you're running those things through your head now. Those people and, and, and the significant times that they were part of your life. I think you hope you're running those through now. He says, many who influence, whose influence on Christianity around the world has been felt far and wide. And then he, he comes with a string of people 
uh, people like Ray Steadman and Howard Hendricks and Charles Ryrie and Dwight Pentecost, just to name a few. I mean, he had a whole lot more, but I, I couldn't name all of them. Okay. And then it says, if you've never heard of some of them, a quick internet search will show just how instrumental they were in shaping a whole generation of Christians. But to be honest, there's another list of men and women whose names probably won't yield a single entry in an online search. Those are the ones. To the world at large, they're just, they're nobodies. They don't, they, they didn't invent anything. They didn't write a best-selling novel. They didn't star in a blockbuster movie. They didn't, the, the record didn't go platinum in sales, nor, or, nor did they run for president, amen. History, for the most part, forgot them except for names etched in headstones or brief summaries of their lives and newspaper obituaries. History has forgotten them. But when we close our eyes and we review the news reels of our own lives, these nobodies make the headlines. They do. People like a high school teacher who taught you how to speak without stuttering. People like a Sunday school teacher who urge you to be more engaged in memorizing scripture and, and leading in the class and, and teaching others to, to trust God and evangelizing to those who may not know God. A, a faithful friend who believed in you and was there when you struggle with some of the toughest issues, personal issues in life. A parent who influenced you to trust God without fearing the unknown. You know, some of us, some some things we didn't do because we just were afraid of what we didn't know. And a pastor who invited you to teach a life-changing Bible class at church or someplace else. These ordinary people whom the world may consider nobodies proved to be invaluable to us during the maturing years of our lives. These kind of people. Is, is there somebody that you can think of? Uh, that that falls in. They don't have to be one of these people, but somebody who 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 who's um, who 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 proved to be invaluable as we matured and as we grew and as we uh, as we matriculated through life. Uh, that was there for us in spite of us, and 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 you know wouldn't let us go, even though we tried hard to get out of what they were trying to help us do. They hung in there with us. They hung in there with. Us. If we could quantify influence, we'd likely conclude that their effort on us through both words and actions exceeds that of the big names. In fact, a nobody taught the reformer Martin Luther his theology. A nobody visited Dwight L. Moody at a shoe stock short store and spoke to him about Christ. A nobody financed William Carey, Lot Carey Ministry in India. A nobody faithfully prayed for Billy Graham for over 20 years. A nobody found the Dead Sea Scrolls and revolutionized Bible study in the 20th century. And a nobody refreshed the Apostle Paul in Rome, in a Roman prison, as he wrote his last letter to Timothy. Think about it. The visible 10% of the iceberg wouldn't be seen without 90% of its mass that is obscured under the water. You couldn't see the tree if the branches and the roots weren't there. Just as a pastor couldn't preach the word week in and week out without the behind the scene work of numerous yet anonymous bodies, without the nobodies of this world, there would be no somebody. Think about that. The men and women laboring behind the scenes are all somebody. Amen, amen. Anonymous somebodies, yes, but somebody's nonetheless. That's what we take away. A friendly farewell helps us to see that everybody that God has placed in our lives has some significance in how he matured us or is maturing us as we go forward. So in the body of Christ, there are no nobodies. Francis Schaeffer once said, there are no little people, not in your life and not in mine. And so here's what I want you to do. 
take some time and, re and reflect on your own life. And, and when you get a moment and you're sitting in your, in, in your sanctuary and, and, you're right, and you're praying and you're reading, write out your own list of somebody's who have been and who still are instrumental in your life. Good exercise. I, I, I worked through this myself. Thank God for each one of them personally. I don't care how many you find. Thank God for them personally. And then, and then take some time to write them a sincere note of encouragement and gratitude. Don't leave that out. Don't leave that out. Remind them that they are somebody in God's economy and then tell them how valuable they've been in your life. That's how we can apply this friendly farewell that we've come full circle with in the book of Colossians. So I encourage you, take some time to reflect. Take some time to step back out of your busyness and reflect on who God has placed in your life, who has made a significant difference. And then step away from the significant difference and go back and think about the people who, who you never could figure out their reason for being there. And ask God to show you what they've done and the impact they've had on your life. Amen. 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 Glory. Now, next week, we're going to venture over into the book of Philip, uh, Philemon. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do the whole chat, whole book, and it's going to be called A Study in Forgiveness. You don't want to miss that. It, it, it's, a, it's a good study, and, um, and it helps us to look at life uh, a little bit differently when it comes to forgiving. I think last night in our women's ministry meeting, we talked a little bit about forgiveness. And one of the things I want you to think about during this week as you, as you reflect on this study and forgiveness is that it's, that it's easier to forgive when you realize that you don't have to forget. Hold on to that. Are there any questions? Let me stop recording. <laughs>